Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger on this episode of Jill on Money. What is the one thing you want to be known for? What is your master narrative? The truth of the matter is whether you own your master narrative or not, you have one. Because all decisions about us are made when we're not in the room. And so when you're not in the room, what do people say about you? You want to know what it is and you want to help shape it and define it. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. You know, every day at work, I am asked to be a translator of complicated financial topics. Off air, we all are doing the same thing. We are communicating with one another. And we are sometimes communicating with people who see us in a very different way than we see ourselves. Our guest, Lee Hartley Carter, has written a really interesting book called Persuasion, Convincing Others When Facts Don't Seem to Matter. Much of this interview is about your interaction with people you work with, you live with, and how you can actually better work with those people to kind of get a sense of who you really are. I think you'll really enjoy it. I know I did. Here's our conversation with Lee Hartley Carter. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. So we'd like to start the podcast off with a simple question. And you ready for it? Mm-hmm. Oh, God, it's the pressure's on right now. What is the best career or financial decision you've ever made? The best career decision I ever made happened about um, 13 years ago. I was in I was in financial services marketing. It was fine, but it wasn't really exciting me and energizing me anymore. And so I decided to go out and find something I was really passionate about. And it took me a while to find that thing, but I did, and I went for it. And... That to me was everything. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where'd you grow up? All right. I grew up in New Jersey. I've um, heard of it. It's the Garden State. <laughs> it is the Garden State. With a really and bad mass transit. <laughs> really, really bad mass transit. And also, Garden State, they do have amazing tomatoes and amazing corn, and no one really knows that about New Jersey. Oh, all right. Well, so, okay. Yeah, Jersey corn earlier in the season. I'm a Long Island corn person. We do later in the season. There you go. Okay. So you grew up in New Jersey. And you go off to college. What did you study? I studied history and sociology. I always had a passion for language. Um, At the dinner table, I would always ask questions like, what do you think the difference is between a nerd, a geek, a dweeb, and a loser? They sound like they're the same thing, but each one very different visual in your mind. Um, So the power of language and messaging always played big in my life. I always loved reading. I always was passionate about about words, and I was also passionate about politics. Um, And so that sort of informed a lot of my early life that then led later to me switching careers to do what I do now. Okay, so talk about the politics stuff. Were your parents political or not at all? No, my parents... What did your folks do? My mom was a stay-at-home mom. She's an artist. Um, And my father uh, was in the electronics business. So not a political family at all. My grandparents, much more politically involved and engaged. I have a great-grandfather who's a congressman. So it maybe skipped a few generations. And I I was always passionate about it. I was a total geek about politics when I was in high school, the kind of person. Like how? What would you do? The chairman of the Young Republicans of New Jersey. You know, that oh kind of God. person. I know, oh I know. And I have God. to admit that living in New York, so. Yeah. And live by that. So what is it about politics that intrigued you? You know, so much of politics is about messaging. You can be inspired and raised to the, you know, to the heavens by a, a great speech. And I grew up under, you know, Ronald Reagan was president when I was young. And I just used to feel so proud to be an American when he spoke. Then you saw the divisiveness, but I also just really the power of, of speech, the power of leadership, so much about it appealed to me. And I also, uh, it, it was a form of a way to connect with others too, by talking about it, having conversations about it, debating it. Um, and it used to be that we had debates about these kinds of things when we were younger, not even when we were younger. It used to be that you had debates about politics in general, and it was we might disagree on tactics, but we both want what's best for the country. And that's that's really faded, and that's sad to me. The part of persuasion, which I found interesting as you lay it out, is that there is almost a science that you talk about mm-hmm. in, in a process that you help your clients, but also anybody, really understand that this begins with having an appreciation for where that other person is coming from and empathy. And so why is that so important in the world of persuading? 
So most often when we're trying to persuade, we, we just think about what we want to say. We create an objective. We say, this is what I want to accomplish. I want people to hire me. I want people to vote for me. I want people to buy my product. And here are all the reasons why somebody should buy my product. They never really slow down and say, what does that other person that I'm trying to talk to need? Where are they coming from? What do they feel about this issue? What do they feel about this product? What do they feel about anything? Why do they feel that way? Without doing that, you're going to just start giving a laundry list of facts, a laundry list of proof points, and you're going to be speaking in some ways just right over the head of the other person until you stop and slow down and say, where is this person coming from? Because it's only once you get to that other person's mindset that you're really going to be able to change hearts, minds, and meet them where they are. And you write... Whomever it is you need to persuade, be it the city council or your in-laws, in a way that truly resonates, makes you matter. Know your customer without judgment, without snark. And you say the golden rule of communicating, talk to your audience as they are, not as you want them to be. Can you give us an example of like the difference between those two ways of thinking about it? I've done a lot of work um, in financial services, for example. Oftentimes people will develop a financial product and they'll have this really technical idea on why it's so important. So let's just talk about variable annuities, for example. Let's, God, I Everybody. hate them. I hate them. And everyone in the insurance industry hates me for hating them so much. Okay. And that's fair. So we can, <laughs> but, but a lot of people would go out there and say, let's talk about guaranteed income for life because that's the benefit. That's why we built these things, right? But the truth of the matter is people aren't sitting out there saying, you know what I wish I had? I wish I had guaranteed income for life because most people in retirement aren't thinking about an income anymore because they already have their pool of money. That's not the way they think about the what they're looking for. What they're looking for instead is protected growth. They want their money to grow and they want protection and they want to know that it's going to be there for them when they need it. So we helped our clients in the variable annuity industry say, let's stop talking about it as guaranteed income for life, which is what everybody was talking about. Instead, let's talk about protected growth strategies. And now that's largely taken over the industry. And the difference between it is one is speaking about the benefit of the product to the insurer. This, we developed it for guaranteed income for life. The other is what is the person looking for? What is the person who's investing looking for? And what they're looking for is protected growth. Of course, but they don't know that it comes with a fat fee that they'll be paying forever and that they could do it in another way. They could do it in another way. I think the thing that they also, some people are, are willing to make that trade-off. Say true, that the fees true, are, true. I don't want to have true. to worry about it. Right. So that's, I want to pay someone to worry so that I don't have to exactly. worry. All right. I got that. That's fair enough. Let's talk about empathy and persuasion. Let's do it like on a micro level. In the book, I talk about this whole thing about emotional empathy. It's built on the change triangle. The change triangle basically says we have positive emotions that serve us, a biological function, and then there's these inhibitory emotions. Those are shame, anxiety. And shame and anxiety will keep us from doing anything productive. So if you put somebody either into shame or into anxiety, so you can fact them by shaming them and say, like, you you don't know this, this isn't absolutely true. Or you can start giving them facts on how much trouble they're going to be in if they don't start investing now or if they don't do things differently. Those two things are going to make people defensive and not do what you want them to do. What you want to do instead is put them in emotions that are make them biologically want to do something. So you get some people angry and they're going to say there's a problem I need to solve, but don't put them in shame or anxiety and there's a difference. So now let's talk about the story part because you talk about empathy and we do a lot, you do a, like a deep dive into empathy. Mm-hmm. And then you also bring storytelling into it and you say that the visual markers and storytelling become incredibly important in the art of persuasion. How so? Our minds don't necessarily remember facts in the same way that we remember stories in the same way that we remember visuals. And they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, all of these kinds of things. With persuasion, what you want to do is create a lasting impression. It takes a while for us to change somebody's mind. So you want to have something that's going to stick. When you wrap data in storytelling, it just allows us to sit with it, to think about it. And it creates sort of a almost like a mnemonic structure for us to remember things in. Likewise, visuals are so important. And that doesn't necessarily even mean you have to have a clear picture, but I talk about the power of visual language and even symbols. So if you think about, for example, Starbucks, years ago when Howard Schultz first came back, the first time he came back to reset Starbucks, they had lost their way. A lot of people complained about the quality of the coffee. They said it tasted burnt. It wasn't as good as it used to be. He came back instead of saying, I'm back and we're going to have better coffee again. He said, I'm back and I'm going to close the doors of every Starbucks for an afternoon 
and we're going to teach every barista to make the perfect cup of coffee. There was something very visual and symbolic, a symbolic gesture that's really powerful and really lasts with all of us much longer than if he just came back and said, I'm going to make, you know, restore the quality of our coffee. Likewise, you see this in politics. Donald Trump didn't say he's going to get tough on immigration. He said he's going to build a wall. You know, Elizabeth Warren right now, she's out there talking about she doesn't have a million policies out there. Her whole thing is she's got a plan for that. I've got a plan for that as a T-shirt. And that becomes her own sort of symbol of creating wonkiness into a in, into a symbol. And so I think when we can try and find ways not just to talk about your policy or your point of view or your product, but to create a visual or a symbol, it allows us to really connect with it in a different way. How important, you know, you talk about authenticity Mm -hmm. in your book. You know, we always hear about that in the workplace. Like, bring your authentic self to work. I'm like, you don't want my freaking authentic self on the television. Thank you very much. You want a part of that. You don't want the whole thing. So can you talk a little bit about why that's important in the idea of communicating in general? We all have weaknesses. We all have strengths. We are most connected to things that we love the good and the bad of them. If there is a weakness that you have, if there is a, you know, a fatal flaw, if there is an elephant in the room, acknowledging it, embracing it, making it part of your narrative, I think is more powerful than ignoring it. I think that we don't necessarily love the perfect anymore. When you see something that's too perfect, we don't believe it or we don't trust it. And so oftentimes now, I think some of the best communicators and the best persuaders, frankly, own their flaws. I think about Hillary Clinton when she was running for president. There was an authenticity gap, I would say, in who she was. But there were a couple moments during her campaign that I thought were so breakthrough for her that I wish she had done more of. She was asked a lot about how how it felt to be criticized or all of these different things. And she always said, well, I don't listen to my critics. I don't listen to my critics. And then there was one moment, and I think it might have been with Stephen Colbert. I'm not exactly sure who the interview was, but she said, you know what? It hurts my feelings. It really hurts my feelings and it's hard. I try to tune it out, but when I can't, it's just, it's terrible. I just thought, wow. Where is that person? Where is that person? Um, She also did an interview with Ellen DeGeneres. She was wearing her blue pantsuit and this little girl came out and wanted to, she said that when she grew up, she wanted to be president of the United States. And Hillary gave her a little blue pantsuit. And the little girl came out wearing this plant suit with oh, pearls. And it was it. like the best thing because it was totally just embracing who she was and not running away from it, trying to make it something else. And I think those are the moments when you have that real authentic connection that creates a, a real powerful um, dynamic between us. And that's what you're looking to have happen. Tell us about what you do right now for a living in the company and so that people know where you're coming from. Yeah. So my company is called um, Ms. Lansky and Partners. We are what we call a language strategy company. And our whole philosophy is it's not what you say that matters, it's what people hear. So our job is really to help companies and associations communicate more effectively on the issues that matter most to them. This isn't about putting lipstick on a pig. These are companies that have good products, good services, good things to say. We're just trying to help them say it in a way that's going to matter and make things, you know, have the impact that they should have. In addition to that, I also am out there talking to voters, trying to understand what's resonating and why. So in the 2015-2016 election cycle, for better or for worse, and regardless of how this makes you feel, the research that we did predicted that Donald Trump was going to be the nominee on the Republican side and then ultimately president. And now um, in this election cycle, I'm doing the same thing on the Democrat side. And so do you get paid for doing that research or you guys are just doing it for like the heck of it and it's kind of cool? So I don't get paid by any politician and we don't get paid for the political work that we do. I think that what we believe and what I believe strongly is it helps us understand the zeitgeist. It helps us understand what's out there and how people are feeling in general. And that only helps us be more effective because as I've been talking about, one of the most important parts of our job is to understand people, why they are the way they are, why they feel the way they feel, why they believe what they believe and why they do what they do. And this is definitely something that helps us do that. So that's interesting. I didn't realize that it was not for pay. And so um, when you go on various television outlets to discuss this, you're just saying this is your proprietary research and that's what you found and that's illuminating and all of that, right? right. Okay. Now, question about the clients. Do you turn clients down when you're like, ugh, that's a gross business. I don't want to do that because you're a private company, right? Yes, we do. So what is the metric by which you decide not to take a client? So we will not take a client that our values don't align with. And, you know, my company, 
despite the fact that I was the chairman of the Young Republicans, I would say 98% of my company's Democrats at this point. Um, so if their values don't align with our values, we won't take on a, a project. And um, we also give our team, if there's something that's controversial, we give our team the right to say, you know, how they feel about it. Um, but for the most part, we don't, um, we don't get involved in anything related to tobacco. We don't get involved in anything related to guns. We don't get involved in anything related to abortion. And then there's some other things along the way that we've had to make decisions on that say this just isn't right. There's also some companies along the way that we've said, you know what, this isn't necessarily the kind of company that we want to be involved with. This is Jill on Money. Hi, I'm Jill Schlesinger, certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, and host of this, the Jill on Money podcast. I'm here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Recently, Marcus personal loans were rated number one for personal loan customer satisfaction by J.D. Power. How did they get that number one rating? Because they put customers first. With a Marcus personal loan, you can choose your loan amount, your monthly payment, and payment date. Also, there are no fees. That means no worrying about late fees or sign-up fees. Even better, their loan specialists are available to help you on the phone. If you're looking to consolidate high-interest debt, pay off credit cards, or make a major purchase, check out Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Go to Marcus.com forward slash Jill. You can money. For J.D. Power 2019 award information, go to jdpower.com slash awards. And now back to our interview with Lee Hartley Carter. So when you're thinking about a crisis management, because you've got an interesting chapter about that, and it made me think a lot back to financial services. Tell me what you thought about the financial service industry in general, the response to the financial crisis, grade their performance. In the, in the immediate aftermath, I would give them an F. But this is what happens in crisis. I always say our first instincts at crisis are absolutely wrong mm-hmm. because we're defensive. Mm-hmm. And so instead of trying to get why everybody in the world was so upset, which we were all so upset because everything, trust crumbled in a, you know, in a day. Everything we trusted was gone. The bailout money needed to be given out. People were angry. And instead of individual companies saying, you know what? We understand why you're so upset. We understand trust has been broken. They were like, it wasn't me. Those guys were worse than I was. <laughs> yeah. It was a few bad actors over here. Instead of acknowledging like, wow, you guys lost your whole retirement savings overnight. It doesn't matter who was responsible. It was the industry as a whole. People were upside down and nobody was acknowledging it. We were doing focus groups with investors and they were so angry. And the people, the executives in the in the banks and the financial institutions that we we're working with were like, but don't they understand that we actually paid back the fail out money? I know that was the funniest response ever because I was like, that means nothing. Nothing. With interest. That's what yeah. they always say. We paid everything back with interest. The government made money on us. Yeah. We were the first ones to pay back that money. It's like, well, who cares? So so you've already made so much money that you can pay it back. My stock portfolio hasn't recovered yet. And it was just, it was so tone deaf. Mm. And it took a long time for people to, to gain trust back. And it's still not there. It still comes out when you're talking to investors sometimes. They're, they're burned. So I had a really funny reaction to it because I felt like nobody was owning it. And after being in the client service business for so many years, I thought, you know, the way you always gain ground in a bad situation is, oh, my God, we blew it. Totally. Right? If you don't start by acknowledging the concern, you will not pass go. If you are in crisis, whether that's in your personal life or whether that's in your professional life or whether it's as a whole company, if you don't say, I get it, I hurt you in some way. Now let's talk about how to move forward. If you don't acknowledge and validate that concern, you're not going anywhere. And it's funny because you're right. People, they get defensive. And then you say the other problem is they start piling on facts like, oh, I paid back the money and here's the interest and here's how much money. But the facts are irrelevant in that particular moment, maybe down the line, right? Like you can sprinkle it down. So can you describe the master narrative and how how important that is to know what you're trying to to get across? So I always say that when we're communicating, it's better to have one point that you're trying to make than a million points. It's like a thousand points of light versus one major spotlight. And when we are communicating, oftentimes what we do is communicate with tons of different facts and lots of different information to try and make our point on why we're a good company, why we're good people, why we should have our, share our point of view. 
And that's not nearly as effective if you distill it down to what's the one thing that you want people to take away from that. So with a pharmaceutical company, for example, what's the one thing that they need to get people to know to help to rebuild their reputation? It is number one, that they are actually inventing the cures that are going to you know, save lives. If they could just get people to understand that, then the rest of it would be less of a problem. Not no problem, because they right. they're going to have problems. Don't right. get me wrong. So they have to have their one thing, and that's inventing for life or however you want to talk about it in those different ways. Likewise, in politics, if if somebody has a a one thing, a master narrative, you will always remember the candidate that won because you will remember their master narrative. With Donald Trump, it was Make America Great Again. With Barack Obama, it was Hope and Change. You will remember what it was because when somebody has a really strong master narrative, it sticks out, it's memorable. The best one that I can think of right now that we all know is Nike, just do it. It sticks and it's more than a tagline. It is the theme. It Mm -hmm. is the anthem. It is that one thing that every time you show up, that's going to be your one thing and it's going to make everything else stick. It's so true. It's really interesting. Should individuals have master narratives just like walking through your day job? Like should Mark, my producer, Mark, let's get your master narrative. All right, there he is. Should we do this? Yes. Really? I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but certainly if you're ever going through a career transition, if you're trying to get promoted, if you're trying to get a new job in your career, in your personal life, it happens anyway. We're all known for something, whether we like it or not. So you might as well own it. What are you known for, Lee? I would say my my master narrative, the thing I'm most proud of is saying that I'm really scrappy. I've always, since I was a little girl, the whole thing is like, I might not know how to do it, but I'm going to get it done. If you give it to me, I'm going to get it done and get it done well. What's the downside of that? <laughs> sometimes you don't say no when you need to. Um, and sometimes you need to admit what you don't know. So I've learned how to to work around those two weaknesses that come along with us. But the truth of the matter is whether you own your master narrative or not, you have one. Because all decisions about us are made when we're not in the room. And so when you're not in the room, what do people say about you? You want to know what it is and you want to help shape it and define it. Can this, you tell that story about getting your um, 360 back and what that what that felt like and tell uh, that as like the, the narrative is established whether or not you like it or not? Yeah. So a few years ago um, at our firm, we did 360 reviews, which allows all of your peers to give feedback on how you're doing. I wanted to know how I was doing. I was hopeful that I was going to get to the next stage of my career. At the time, I was a partner in my firm, but I wasn't in a leadership position beyond that. Um, and I wanted to get the next step. And so I got this feedback and I was hopeful um, that I would get some good feedback that could help me be a better leader. The feedback that I got was that people viewed me as a leader, but not a very good one. Um, And that was really tough. I think in large part because people viewed me more as a friend than a leader. And Mm -hmm. that's a leadership style. that's very dangerous when you're too close to friendship. You can't be a good leader. So that was one thing. And that surprised me. The second thing is I am very good at getting new business. But the the downside to that was that many people um, had thought that I was using my looks to get new business. That That's was so really, weird. That came back as a 360 feedback. Did. And this was pre Me Too. Well, I'll tell you in a second why, what, where I, where I got to that and where it came from. And the third piece was at the time I had been going through some fertility related challenges and I had been out of the office a bunch. Mm. And so people had been filling in those gaps by saying she's not present. She's slacker. They didn't know where I was. I always tell people if you're anything that's left ambiguous is going to be interpreted negatively. That's Mm -hmm. just the way it goes. Right. So those are the three pieces of data. It was really tough feedback and I was heartbroken. I would cry. I'm like about to cry right now because I'm like sitting in your shoes and saying how hard that must feel. That to feel like that from your colleagues. Oof. Yeah. I almost couldn't go back to work. I, I hear I, you. I went home. My CEO gave me the feedback and he said, I just want you to know this is going to be really tough, but I've got your back. And I think if he hadn't done that, I might not be here today. Like it was mm-hmm. it was so heartbreaking. And I had a decision to make. I say either I've got to get curious about what this is all about or I've got to go find another job. But things can't stay the same. And I cried. I thought about quitting. I thought about reaching out to headhunters. I didn't know what to do. And then I thought, no, I love what I do. Mm-hmm. I've got to be able to turn this around. Mm-hmm. This has got to, let me look into this. What, what is this feedback all about? The first one about leadership style is like, you know what? You're right. I've got to stop being friends with everybody. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Because if I want to be a leader, I've got to send myself home before everybody gets drunk at happy hour. And I've got to start doing things a little bit differently. 
The second piece, and that that was really difficult for me, the, the piece about using my looks for um, new business. And then I started thinking about it and I said, you know what? There was a client who in front of my colleagues asked me to go up to his mini bar for a drink while we were all out. And then there was another client who hit on me in front of others. And then there was another client that touched my face in front of people. It was really bizarre stuff. Mm-hmm. They were all sort of similar kinds of people. And so there became a joke at the company. And I didn't know how to I didn't know how to deal with it besides make a joke out of it because I thought it was right. like, what that, do you do? Hello, that's what we used to do. We'll you just, made a joke out of it or else you would be called like, uh, you, you're so, oh, don't get your, uh, you know, you're so sensitive. Yeah. So then there was this ongoing joke. A new client would come in and they'd be like, oh, that's what Elise. And I would be like, ha, ha, ha. And so... I realized that it became part of my narrative. It became Mm. the thing that people were saying about me and it was a joke, but it wasn't funny. And then the third piece was I understood why people, if you don't see someone there all the time, you don't know where they are, got to do it. So got in front of everybody and I said, listen, I got your feedback. I want you to know, I love it here more than anything and I'm committed to turning it around. And I heard three major themes. Here's what they are. I repeated them back. I said, one, you view him as leader and not a very good one. And that's going to change. You want me to do more thought leadership. You want me to be more of a leader. That's starting now. Number two, I heard what you said about new business and it breaks my heart because I'm really good at what I do. And for you to think that I use my looks to do anything related to it makes me sick, but I get it. I said, I've thought a lot about it and I heard what you said. I'm going to ask you to join me in never making a joke again Mm -hmm. about a client hitting on me. Mm -hmm. I've made the jokes. You've made the jokes. That stops today. We're done. Anybody ever does it again, I will stop you in your tracks because it is wrong. It is unambiguously wrong and I will reject it and it is no longer acceptable here. And the third thing is I need you guys to know that I had a surgery. It went wrong and it's been really hard for me and I should have told you, but from now on, I'm going to put it on my calendar, all of my doctor's appointments and you'll know where I am without, without any question. Mm. And that's where I've been. And outside of those doctor's appointments, I will be here and I'll be present. It was a reset moment. It changed everything. And within a year and a half, it really, really turned the corner. That's great. But that's hard. So hard. But that's the power of, I think, authenticity and vulnerability and all of these things that are so important to Mm -hmm. persuasion. I think, and that goes back to the point in crisis communications, acknowledging people's concerns and owning them. Yep. And if I didn't, it never would have changed. When you see like a big... Uh, something like the Equifax data breach or the mm. Wells Fargo fiasco. What do you think is the, what is the CEO's job in that moment to say, buck stops here, it's me. What should be happening? Because it feels like not enough happens in that moment. Or something like sort of ham-handed happens, but then, you know, the guy loses his job, you know, after being under hauled under the congressional subcommittees. Like, what is it that should be going on in that crisis management? I think the thing that happens the most, which is the most unfortunate thing, is that the lawyers take charge. Yes. All messaging, all actions, all everything gets lawyered to death. Lawyers are important. But the bottom line is there's a a financial risk associated with legal risk. There's not necessarily a financial risk that they see today that's associated with communications risk. Mm. And so communications gets so watered down in those moments that we have no idea what to believe. We have no idea what to think. People are afraid to apologize. They're afraid to own it. They're afraid to say that it's never going to happen again. They're afraid to talk about the actions that they're taking. So we're just looking at this blur and say, wow, that sounds awfully legalese. And I'm afraid that they're not doing the right thing by me. I don't trust them. And their stock price is plummeting in the meantime. And so I think that what companies need to do better is elevate the role of communications in those moments to be equal to the lawyers. Right. It's almost like you want the communications people and the legal team to talk about this and to say, well, what's our risk if we say it this way? There is a formula. And, you know, every company has a crisis playbook somewhere on a shelf that says this is what you must say if a data breach happens. This is what you must say if, you know, somebody goes to jail. This is what you must say. They exist. But the problem is there's not really a playbook for every scenario as it happens. Mm -hmm. And As it happens, fear gets involved, emotions get involved, and everybody's saying, well, if we say that, then they might think this. If we say that, then legal might say this. Instead, what we need to do is say there's a formula here, and it works almost every time. Number one, we need to acknowledge concerns. Let's start there. How can we acknowledge concerns in a way that's legally okay? 
Yeah. But most companies won't even start by acknowledging concerns in any way, shape or form. You've got to start there. The second thing that people need to do is know what actions are you going to take to change behavior? So if we're talking about Equifax, there's a data breach. What actions are happening right now that are keeping people's data safe and what can they take? There's always something you can be talking about, but the formula is always there. Why people don't don't follow it is baffling to me, mm. but I think the truth of the matter is it, it rests because of the legal risk. Right. And it's also, I don't want to go and venture into this place where I'm so uncomfortable and acknowledging that. And if I can hang it on the lawyers, oh, the lawyers won't let me do it. Totally. This happened to me because I called someone up about an article that was written and I said, I'd like to bring you on to my show to talk about it. It's a great opportunity. No, lawyers won't let me do it. It's, so it's like so silly. So, All right. So silly. I got to let you go. I mean, I mean, we could be sitting here talking for hours and hours <laughs> and hours. So let's do some fun stuff. First of all, before we let you go, we started the interview and I asked you, hey, what is the best personal finance or career decision you made? And you were like, it was kind of great to get out of financial services and follow your passion. What was the worst decision that you made? The worst decision that I made? Oh, boy. I've made a lot of bad decisions. The well, just pick decision. one of them. You know what? Um, the worst the worst financial decision that I made is after the financial crisis and my my portfolio got hammered, I pulled my money in cash for a long time because I was afraid. Oh. And that's just dumb. That was not a great I one. was, I mean, I was young. You're listening to Jill on Money. Okay, it's time for the Marcus Minute presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Today in the hot seat is author and president Lee Hartley Carter. Okay, Lee, you ready to play? I'm ready. Here we go. What's one word to describe your relationship with money? Complicated. What's always worth spending on? Shoes. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? Shoes. <laughs> How much do you spend on a haircut? Uh, $100. That's cheap. Whose face would you put on the dollar bill? Uh, I know it's a hard one. I'm sort of like Washington's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, Washington's totally fine. What's wrong with Washington? It's your last day on earth. You've got $100 that you didn't spend on your haircut in your pocket. What is your last meal for $100? My last meal for a hundred dollars. Good night. You know what? My last. It's my favorite meal I had growing up. It's steak on the grill with my family and tater tots. <laughs> Lovely. The book is called Persuasion: Convincing Others When Facts Don't Seem to Matter. The author is Lee Hartley Carter. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks to Lee Hartley Carter. Remember, we drop new episodes of Jill on Money every Tuesday and Thursday, and sometimes we throw in a bonus as well. Remember, if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13. And the show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. See you next week.